worship service tonight, right? That's right. All right. So we've got him until, a, you know, as long as he can stay. <laughs> All right? So I want to um, introduce Rabbi Howard Siegel. He's only been at Temple Israel since August. So he is um, coming in here, filling the shoes after um, Rabbi Murray Ezring retired after 25 years. And uh, so he's coming in. And he's got Minnesota roots. Yeah. So we want to welcome you and uh, maybe start, um, Rabbi, to talk about what's the difference between uh, the different temples over at Shalom Park. Okay. Shalom Park is a, is, a, is a very interesting enterprise. It's become a model to many Jewish communities around the country. They were far ahead of themselves when they established the concept of a Jewish campus that brought together all or most of the Jewish organizations on one campus. Uh, the Jewish Community Center in this case, uh, their Jewish Federation, which is our umbrella fundraising uh, organization. And it has on the campus two synagogues. Uh, there's, a, there's an old joke, by the way, about a man who was stranded on a desert island <laughs> A Jew stranded on a desert island, and he was, dis he was found some 15, 20 years later. And they, when they found him, they noticed that he'd done a lot of building. And he, he had built two synagogues. <laughs> and they said, wh wh why did you build two synagogues? Oh, this is the one I belong to. That's the one you couldn't pay me to join. <laughs> oh, you too, huh? <laughs> that happens. <laughs> yeah. So, but that's not why there are two synagogues there. There's actually, there, it, this, this community is, is interesting in many ways. One is it does not really have a formal orthodox or the, the most, uh, I won't say traditional, because we consider ourselves the most right wing, as it were, uh, presence in, this, in the community. As, but it does have a small group of uh, people there called the Lubavitch. And uh, they are, as I was talk, we were talking earlier, <laughs> they're an outreach organization to Jews. They, they do a lot of uh, outreach to, to Jews who, have, who, who, have unaf who are unaffiliated or disaffiliated. On the campus, we have two synagogues. The larger one, Temple Bethel, is a reform synagogue. And Temple Israel, which is the synagogue I'm with, which is the older of the two, Temple Israel's been around for 130 years oh, wow. in, uh, in the Charlotte community in several different locations. And it, the, these are the two main synagogues that occupy it. The difference between Reform Judaism and Conservative Judaism, it's difficult to explain to Jews. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I'm going to say that, that uh, the, the Conservative Ju movement, which was uh, founded here in the United States at about the beginning of the 20th century, was an effort to Americanize the huge emigration of Jews from Eastern Europe in the late 19th century. And we, we, st we are adherents to Jewish law, we're a traditional movement, but I would say our, modern is, our, our motto is tradition and change. The reform movement is older, it goes back to, uh, e to uh, Germany uh, after the, uh, the Enlightenment, after the, the French Revolution and such. And it was uh, at that point, Jews, after the French Revolution, when, when Jews were emancipated, as it were, and were allowed to become citizens of the countries they lived in, uh, many Jews decided after many years of suffering under, under an anti-Semitic separa separations and things of this sort, that they would just opt out of Judaism. Enough of this already. We put up enough with, uh, with, 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 with what comes with being Jewish. And the Reform Movement was an effort to keep them Jewish while helping them f uh, mix in with the general population. And so but today, the three movements uh, uh, really, rep the reform movement represents the liberal movement in Judaism. The conservative movement represents sort of the middle ground. Conservative, by the way, doesn't mean, is not a political statement. It's, uh, it's not small c, it's large c, and it was the, the, it was the title was, was given to the movement by its founder who, was, who wanted to conserve Judaism among these Jews who were coming from Eastern Europe. 
And so this name sort of uh, uh, stayed with us. In Israel, we're known as Masorti, or traditional Judaism, which is, confu which is also confusing. <laughs> So the, the Orthodox on the far and the and then you have the Orthodox on the far right. So those are the two main synagogues. We we get along very well together, and uh, in the short time I've been here, my my impression is that this this is a, a this Jewish community is a very solid Jewish community. It's a growing Jewish community, not unlike Charlotte or North Carolina for that that matter. It's become a uh, a wonderful place to live, and there's there's opportunities here. And uh, I know friends. I have friends. I'm from the West Coast, by the way. I, well, I, I went to the University of Minnesota, and I served as a rabbi in Minnesota for ten years. Um, I grew up in Seattle, and I was born in Los Angeles, on the on the west on the West Coast. But now it's interesting. I have a lot of West Coast friends and people I know who are moving from California to North Carolina. So. I don't know if that's good. I don't know if you want these Californians. <laughs> well, I want to thank you for being here on such short notice. And mm -hmm. really, if you need a Lutheran talk over at your place, um, I'm, your, I'm your guy. Because that comes up so often, right? <laughs> no, but in Houston, my synagogue shared a parking lot with a Lutheran church. Oh, really? And it was also, it was the EL, what is it? The ELCA. ELCA, yeah. Oh, good. And so we had a dialogue. We had, we had, we had you know, you share a parking lot, you gotta get, you gotta get together. <laughs> well, Pastor Drew and I have a list of questions that we have assembled from the four different classes that we're teaching on, on this, um, the CBE. Um, and so we're gonna kind of interview him together. And um, okay. one of the questions that we had, especially with Leviticus, can, can you talk about the whole sacrificial system? And, and there's several things. Um, um, all, the, all the blood being splattered all over. What's the use of the, why the, all the blood splattering and the internal organs and the fat and um, the heart and everything else? The second thing is, when did that sacrificial system end and why? Okay. The... The book of Leviticus is, a, is an interesting book. Now, first of all, I, 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 I want to make a blanket statement here about our Bible. What, what you refer to as the Old Testament, we don't have anything else, and so we refer to it commonly as, as the Hebrew Bible. But in the Jews don't understand the Hebrew Bible literally. We understand it in a figurative manner in many respects. And the book of Leviticus is a good example. First of all, I'm gonna put you back into a historical period in, in the time of biblical, uh, in, in, in the Bible, in the biblical era. And at that point, before the, uh, before the, the Abraham came on the scene, before the belief in a, in a one God, you had uh, a various other beliefs and the sacrifice was a key element in, in, the, in, in the worship of the, uh, of the ancient Near Eastern uh, tribes and, and pagan religions of the time. And so to have gone cold turkey on, sacrificial, on the sacrificial cult in the very beginning probably would, would have ended the enterprise from the, from the very outset. Sacrifice was, where, was how ancient man understood they're coming close to God. In Hebrew, the word that's used in the, in the Torah, in the five books of Moses, in the Hebrew translation is korban. Now, the word korban, the root of it is, is, is kufresh vet, which is, means karav, which means to bring near. A korban, a sacrifice, was a way of bringing a person near to God. Did God require it? Do, does, does our God need this, food, need this for food? No, and this was one of the, the main differences between Judaism or, or between monotheism, at least at this time, and the, uh, the other Near Eastern religions. They, their gods required food. They required this as for, for, for sustenance or what have you. Our God doesn't need it. We need it. And to have gone cold turkey on it would have been, uh, been, would have been like saying, well, you can't pray. You can come here, but you can't pray. Prayer really was not introduced until the ancient rabbis in the first century before the Common Era. 
then, by that time, sacrifice in the ancient temple, the second temple, ha had become so corrupt. The priests at the time, the priests uh, had become so corrupt that there were a group of, of teachers who were, uh, and the word rabbi really means great one, and it was a title given to, to a person based on their knowledge, their learning. And what these men tried to do, and they were men, they tried to, they, their effort was to wrest the authority for teaching the Torah from the hands of the priests and put it in the hands of the people. And in doing so, when, they, when the temple was destroyed in the year 70, when the, and burned to the ground by the Romans, Judaism didn't die because it had already been wrested from the priests and there had already been little academies set up all around. And where sacrificial cult ended, prayer was instituted. And so today in our synagogues, in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, we have a morning service each day and an afternoon service. Now, that was because even though we, we, there's no intention to ever go back to a sacrificial cult, we've moved beyond that. Nonetheless, we give honor to that, to, to, to that by having a morning service like they had a morning sacrifice in the temple or an afternoon comparable to an afternoon. The ancient rabbis then added an evening service, which was of their own addition. And this was, a, this was during the first few centuries of the Common Era. So sacrifice was, and it was even on its way out during the time of the prophets. Um, we just, we fin we're actually in the midst of a holiday season right now, Sukkot, which is the, uh, yep, the, the booths. Um, but last week, uh, last week at this time, what's this, Wednesday? Um, last week at this time, we were finishing our observance of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And there's a reading that we have every year on the Day of Atonement from the book of Isaiah. And when Isaiah basically uh, chastises the people for bringing their sacrifices to the temple while they're out exploiting each other in business and this and that. And his question is, what, wh why bother with these stupid sacrifices? If you're, if you're just, if, they, they're, if they're so meaningless to you that you're just going out, you're, you bring them and then you leave. And even then there was a, there was a hint even during the prophet's time, that sacrifi the sacrifice, sacrificial cult had started to wane on the, uh, on the people the, and on the horizon. So we saw it, you know, go about, but the, uh, the, but so the sacrifice, but yet we maintain our allegiance to the Torah. And so we read the book of Leviticus every year. And we read about this, the, the burnt offerings, the Holocaust offering, the, the sin offering, the this offering, the that offering, the Thanksgiving offering. And... There, there are just a couple other comments about the sacrifice. As bloody as it sounds, and it is, interesting, with the exception of, of what's called the burnt offering, or it's often called the Holocaust offering, which was the only offering in which the animal which was slaughtered first was, was, was totally consumed in the sacrifice. Every other offering was eaten. It was either eaten by the priests or by the person, the celebrants, those who brought it to the temple. Uh, it's, I, I don't encourage animal sacrifice, and, and there's nobody who does, <laughs> but there is a, there's a, a small group of, uh, uh, of a, a small a group in northern Israel, actually it's in part of the, it, it's in the, it near Nablus, uh, which, is near, which was called Shechem, in ancient times, the Arabs, but there's called they're Samaritans, they're Shomronim, and they still observe Passover in, according to the Bible. Now, in the old days, when I old days, when when I was in, I, I spent about two years studying in Israel, and this was in the 1970s when um, when you could still uh, you could still drive uh, and go all over the place, and there would you could go up into the uh, into Jew, uh, into the northern northern area of of Israel, which is now part of the occupied territory in the Western Bank, West Bank, and there the Shomronim each year would bring out their goats, or bring out their, not their, uh, yeah, well, they were goats. And they would be off, and they would take them, and they would go through the whole ritual as, as it was described in you know, the Passover ritual, literally slaughtering them, 
and then they would go to their huts. They had huts right there, and they would, they would, they would uh, cook them or grill them or barbecue them, and then take them up to their house, and they ate it, they, had, they finished their meal before midnight. And what you saw is a reliving of it. And I was prepared to be just, uh, uh, and I was to a certain, but, but you what the faces and the, the I mean, you, you could see, I, I was almost transported back 2,000, 3,000 years ago to the sort of uh, feelings and attitudes and celebration that, uh, you know, that gra they would take the blood and they would paint it on their kids' faces and it was, not, it's not, you know, it wasn't, it, but at the same time, it was, at the, t at the it was powerful. Thank you. Okay, that's sacrifice in a quick well, So with, with, the sa with the sacrifice, I understand that today, as you read Leviticus, you don't feel compelled to do <laughs> sacrifices anymore. No. And in fact, by the time uh, 70 comes, 70 um, is... Um, uh, that's really where the ending happens here. Yeah, oh, the, yeah. Once, see, sacrifice during ancient times could only be done in one place, and that was the temple. And without the temple. And, and, and basically, the temple's only purpose was for bringing sacrifice. Sacrifice, you know, the, uh, and with it gone, there was, there was no way, you know, unless you were going to rebuild it. And the ancient rabbis were not really interested in rebuilding the temple. Although it's been, we, we have a phrase we say, we, we sing, we hope for the rebuilding of the temple, but we don't mean it in literal terms. Yeah. In, the rebuilding of the temple is, is, is meant, is really just a euphemism for a messianic era. So the, the term you use, priest, in the Old Testament, that would come from the Levitical line, right? Yep. Does that mean that Everybody from the Levitical line was a priest, or they chose from that line the priest. No, the uh, <laughs> as you uh, uh, those of you, if you if you know your Bible, you know that Moses had a brother, right? Aaron, and Aaron was was appointed high the, the high priest, and Moses was was the the leader, and he he was the priest. He was in charge of the religious aspect of of the enterprise. The uh, so going forward. Everyone who is relate, everyone who calls themselves a Kohen, a priest, should be able to trace their lineage back to Aaron. Okay, I'm a Levi. I, there's a, most most Jews are not are just are just a regular what they call Israelite or Israeli, but I'm my, I should be able to trace my lineage supposedly back to Moses. Now maybe you know I haven't gone on Ancestry.com yet. <laughs> No, but there were more so, less so the, 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 the Kohanim, the priests. It's very interesting when, when a lot of the Jews came from Eastern Europe, they came through Ellis Island in New York. And when they arrived in Ellis Island, they came with names, Eastern European names, that were often very difficult to, uh, to pronounce. Right. And so it was not uncommon for the, the, uh, the, the, the person meeting them there, the agent, to say, okay, uh, Okay, your name's going to be Cohen or Smith. By the way, there's a whole lot of Jews with the name Smith <laughs> because they couldn't pronounce the name. You're Smith. You're Smith. Um, so when, did, yep. when was the term priest dropped in favor of rabbi? Well, rabbi and priest were two opposites. They, 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 the, rabbi had, the rabbi wanted to have nothing to do with the priest. The Kohanim, the priests, were, of, were as I say, they were all family related. They also became the aristocracy during the final years of the temple. They became a group called, the, in Hebrew, they were called the Tzidukim, the righteous. They would be the Sadducees? They would be the Sadducees. And then the, the, the rabbis were called the Purushim, which means the separatists or Pharisees. the Pharisees. And so the rabbis were, were, were I won't say arch enemies. They, were, they weren't fighting, you know, uh, uh, violently, but they clearly were on two opposite ends. Got it. And, the, uh, and so when the, pre, and the, you, the, the title rabbi, as I say, what was purposely given to a person who had attained a certain amount of knowledge, regardless of who their father was. Let's go back to our favorite book, Leviticus. And um, we, we, we thought there's some really good laws in there. Like, for instance, when you're, 
when you're doing your harvest, leave a little bit for the poor to glean the field. Um, if, a, if an old person comes into the room, stand up and show respect. Don't eat roadkill. We thought all of those were really good. How, how compelled is the Jewish community today to, to follow all those other rules, such as, hey, is that a poly cotton blend that you're wearing right there? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Shotness is what the Hebrew term is for, for mixed... Uh, <laughs> You know, um, they're, um, um, in the Orthodox community, they, they are still very observant of, of that. In fact, they have what they're called shotness labs, where you can take your clothes and have them inspected to see if there's, the, or if there's linen and wool are together. Uh, the, there are some things that, that really we don't make sense. Okay, I mean, in, in, in practical terms, we're talking about an ancient, an ancient document. The... Uh, but the other, the, the chapter 19, I think that is in, in, in Leviticus, is, it's, uh, it's called the Holiness Code. And it, it, it is a wonderful chapter. It's my favorite chapter in the entire Torah because amidst all this blood and, 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 and comes this incredible thing, you know, it takes you, haftal reyacha kamocha, love your neighbor like yourself, and, and so on. And so one beautiful uh, explanation, you know, a, after another. The, uh, it's the moral ethical values that, that really have come to shape uh, Jewish life and to shape what we call in Hebrew mitzvot. A mitzvah is a command, an obligation. And the mitzvot were obligations that fell upon Jews. Now, if I can just, I just want to take this one step because I know that one of the other questions was, was with regard to God. Where, where is God in, in, in all of this? And even to the question of the authorship of the, the Torah. But the, the mitzvot are way, I, I see these, even like what's described in, in Leviticus, a lot of our ritual is not, I, I don't feel, God, I, I follow the dietary laws, kashrut, keeping kosher. Um, I don't do it because God commands me to do it. I don't think God really is going to worry about what God has the time to care whether whether I eat ate milk and milk meat together or if I ate this meat or not or I ate this fish and this. I don't. It's not. For, it's for me. It's ritual, like those described in the Torah, are ways to discipline me in such a fashion that I can carry out God's works. I can do what is godly. And I compare this, by the way, to, uh, oh, there's a lot of you here. You, you remember Michael Jordan. I mean, he's from North Carolina, right? <laughs> Michael. <laughs> no, no, I think he, he, he leads our, he used to lead our service back in, uh, you know, everybody's Jewish. He must be. But you, Michael, one of the things that, that, uh, uh, that Michael Jordan taught us, yes, he was a great basketball player. Maybe he's the greatest that's ever played the game. But he wasn't great just because he got out there each day and did magnificent things. He did those magnificent things because he practiced and pra he was the first one in the gym at night and the last one out at first one in the gym in the day and last one out at night. And he did the, the rituals are like the discipline to discipline. I, I eat. I keep kosher because if I can learn to if I the fact that I can't eat every single thing that's out there reminds me that I don't have. Uh, dominance over this entire world, dominance over all creations. But it also, if I can learn to curb my appetite, curb what goes into my mouth, then how much more so what will come out of my mouth? And it's so our rituals, and, and the, it, which is the very similar to what you're talking about here, it's one thing to ask somebody to, to, uh, uh, to as it says, and I, I believe it's in Leviticus, but certainly did, if your enemy's uh, uh, ox is, uh, has fallen under, you, yeah. you, you're obligated to help bring it. Now that's, a, you know, how many would do that? But if you disciplined yourself if you, if, if, to the point where you know that this is the right thing to do, despite the situation. By the way, it, it, this also informs us in many of the matters we're talking about immigration and things like that, but that's oh, yeah. another subject. Well, let me just follow up on that before I give okay. the mic over to Pastor Drew here. Um, the concept about in, in Leviticus, we yeah. preached it on this on Sunday. Um, I am a holy God, mm -hmm. and I set you apart mm -hmm. 
as a holy people. That is a separate for my purpose. Um, how, how does one become righteous before a holy God? Is it the sacrifices? Is it the laws? Is it, how is that righteousness? Well, the, the, it's, 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 it, when the Hebrew word, am segula, which has been sometimes uh, translated as chosen people, but is correctly translated as, as a treasured people. Basically, it's, it's, Jews are no better than anyone else. And we're, we're not, that, that be part, being part of the Jewish people doesn't make you righteous. But what it does, in fact, there was a question years ago. That, if I, can I have two minutes on a story? You bet. Okay. <laughs> years ago, I had a, uh, one of my teachers uh, came to a synagogue. That I started my career in Vancouver, British Columbia, where I was for about 10 or 11 years. And the, uh, one of my teachers came, we came as a scholar in residence. And he was asked by somebody um, in the back, he says, well, who wasn't Jewish, he says, you know, why do you, keep, why do you people think you're chosen? What makes you so special? And he said, and he answered, he said, you know, it doesn't mean we're the chosen people. We're not. But what we've been given is we've been given with the Torah the opportunity to rise above if we, wa if we grasp those moral, ethical imperatives. So just because you're Jewish doesn't mean you're a part of any special people. But God has, has, cho has selected, as the, the people said, listen, I'm going to give you these moral, ethical teachings and ways of life. I want you to be an example to other peoples. Not that you're no more special than anybody else. So those of us who strive to meet those obligations, who strive to rise above just the norm, do, I think, and, and, and that's true of every aspect of society. Every, anybody who strives to make this work, to make this a better world for all peoples, is putting themselves on a higher level. Nobody is born into uh, chosenness. Well, the same thing in, in the New Testament, we've got that same admonition saying, you are salt of the earth, you are light of the world. That is, you are meant to look and smell and taste mm -hmm. and act differently than the rest. Mm -hmm. To that same point, mm -hmm. um, our behavior mm -hmm should be different. Well, I mean, this is, this is a common feature. I mean, it's, it's, there's no secret, of course, that, that, that uh, much in Christianity reflects Judaism, right? Um, where, where the roots come from. And so the whole notion of, of religion, at least in the Western, relig Western religions, was to create a body of people who rose above just the mundane, just the, the, the you know, and, and set an example an example for others of what this world can really be like if we work together. What it can be like if we can learn to help each other. What it, we can, what it can be, you know, and, and uh, I think it's, uh, in a sense, we continue to work together. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if this is a two-minute answer or a two-day answer. Okay. <laughs> My next question here. Um, you talked about the different branches of Judaism. Yeah. Um, what is the, um, the concept of heaven or hell? Or is it just earthly related, or is there something beyond the grave? Well, I'm going to give you an interesting answer. Oh, good. Uh, uh, we, don't, we don't believe in, uh, I have a formal belief in a hell, okay? The, the notion that the, the Judaism has is when God created humankind, it, this was one of the crown, well, the crown of his creation was the Sabbath, but this was, this was certainly one of his great, the greatest creations. And, and everything God created is good, and God is not going to destroy or burn or, or condemn to hell his, his, uh, his creations. What we do, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, embrace in, in this concept is the notion of, well, let me see, let me put this in... Um, I started off, I was talking about, uh, about where there is a concept of, of, of coming by, joining in with heaven. You talked about the afterlife. You mentioned the afterlife. It's very interesting because while Christianity has, has made, the, the, I mean, the, the, the other world is really, and, and, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, because I, you know, it's, it's, the, in a sense, Life, you, you put up with this world, That's and what the, goal. The, the goal, goal is to be taken into the bosom of Jesus. 
and, and we work for that date. The, the notion of an afterlife, interestingly enough, is you won't find it in, the, in, in, the, uh, in the, what you call the Old Testament or in the Torah. They did, it was, it, the whole concept did not come about, they start talking until the ancient rabbis in the first century before the Common Era. The note, when, when Christianity, when, uh, with, your, with the story and the create, with, with Jesus and what came thereafter, already the seeds of, an, of, a, of, a, of a concept of afterlife were, were present. Judaism talked about it too, but then suddenly as a result of the growth of Christianity and the, the, the not the threat, but the, well, the threat in the sense that it presented during the early centuries to Jews, the whole not, concept of, of uh, afterlife was pushed to the back burners. We didn't talk about it. We talked about, and we talk about uh, making this world work, making this world work. But yet, when you get to that last moment, I was a hospice chaplain for a while, also in Minnesota. Mm. And the, uh, and I had to, as, there were, there were a lot, this was a home care hospice, and there, and I obviously as the, as the, uh, the spiritual coordinator was for Jews, dealt with Jews, but half of my clientele were non-Jews. And so I had a responsibility to, uh, to, to work with them as well. And I saw in religious Christians something I didn't see as much among Jews. And that was with this, this whole notion of, 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 of coming into, you know, being taken into Jesus' bosom, a religious Christian was, was uh, found peace as, as the end came nearer. Sometimes it was more difficult for the Jew because not a, lot of, not a lot of time was ever spent talking about an afterlife as much as this world. I can say today that we, we do, there is notions of, uh, of an afterlife, and we've talked about it, in, in a, I can't do it all regal on one foot, but um, the, uh, I hope that sort of answers the question. Well, does it also depend on which branch of Judaism mm -hmm. as to how mm -hmm. much that's emphasized or de-emphasized? No, it's, it's just that it's the times now. It, we're, we're far more comfortable talking about and dealing with, with the notions of life after death. And, uh, and going back and looking at some of the ancient traditions and understanding them even in our time. Good. Otherwise, I'll let you take it over a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, a friend of mine used to refer to that, Rabbi, as the tikkun olam, the healing of the world now, that we work for the betterment of the world today. Um, well, the whole note, yeah, the tikkun olam, which is, uh, yeah, repairing the world, was a... Uh, uh, a, 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 um, the Jewish mystics, the Kabbalists. This was a, this was a, what we call a Kabbalistic notion, mm. of, uh, which, which I can, which would take me a, a long time to explain <laughs> to you. But the notion is that the world is in the God created the world, and certainly one one way that the, that the Kabbalists taught us, and one way of looking at it is, is God didn't finish creation. God went so far and then said to humankind, okay. You finish it. And we have for these, these thousands and thousands of years been trying to do that. And the completion, tikkun olam, when we finally repair the world, that is, in a sense, the messianic era. Yeah. It's a beautiful image of the calling of partnering with God in that work yeah. of, of healing. It's, it is. It's a partnership, exactly, and that's uh, where it's, it's not just, in fact, prayer, in a sense, is, 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 is very different. Uh, if you ask me what is prayer, I, I don't, when I go to the synagogue and I, I pray for the end to a, <laughs> to a war, I'm, I'm not praying be, that God come out of the sky and suddenly, you know, put an end to the war. The prayer is a way of reminding me. I'm, speak, I'm talking to myself, by the way. I mean, I, I'll give you a little of my theology. When God created humankind, the, what, what's the difference between us and, and all the, of, uh, God's other acts of creation? We're in his image, but what, what did he do differently? What did God do differently that he, in, in the act of creation? He, the nishmat chayim, he breathed the breath of life. And that breath within each of us is our soul. That's the godliness that each and every human being carries with them. And each and every human being is an image of God. If we, if we could actually believe that, we would respect each other a little bit more. Amen. But the notion is that being born, be, carrying this godliness with us 
is is uh, y y what was the question again? Yeah. I want I want I I I got the so caught the partnering with yeah, the Lord. Yeah, the partner yeah. Uh -huh. That we we have we have within us the you know the uh, the obligation and also the ability to work to make this better. Yeah. So we have to partner with God. I mean and uh, God will do his part, but we'll do our we have to do ours. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. It raises a question that we as we teach through the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible um uh, encounter a lot, and it's a hard one to answer, to be honest. Um, so help us, um, maybe if you could, um, when when you come to the passages where the Lord um, the Lord commands the people to 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 seemingly put to death uh, to, or to kill those who are, live in Canaan, or there's a man in Exodus who's out collecting sticks and he breaks the Sabbath and he's put there, to death to be stoned. Yeah. How do you teach your people? How do you respond to those passages? And um, where might we find some uh, some hope? In well, those see, passages? they were misinterpreted when he said that the one who's carrying gets stoned. He meant he meant marijuana, and we do. Which, <laughs> I mean, and, uh, that clears and it. All, that clears all it these censures. <laughs> 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 Now, you know who else is a Jew? Right, yeah. Mel Brooks. That's right. <laughs> right? Um, mm. You know, the, the, the question is, when, when you read the Bible, and, and, and you follow, and, and, and then you start reading this, uh, some of the teachings and the commentaries on the Bible and the philosophers over the centuries, sometimes it seems like there are different gods. Mm. But in, in a sense, what it is, God doesn't change we do we do and our understanding of god reflects our changes over the centuries mm. for biblical man there was a great deal of superstition that was very much a part of their teaching and certainly just like we saw the the effort to in in leviticus with the 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 the, the holding on to the sacrifices and some of the other things I'll give you another verse in, in, that you see in Leviticus. It says, Lo tevashel gadi vechalevi mo. You probably know that verse. <laughs> I, I, you shall not seethe or cook a kid in its mother's yeah, milk. Which is understood, the ancient, by, even by the time of the ancient rabbis, they knew that the, the reason for that was the Canaanites had a ritual mm. of seething a kid in its mother's milk. And so we're doing something different. We're not going to do that. It was, but, but we can't, but how do we explain, again, this is how the Torah grows. By the first century, the ancient rabbi says, this means that you shouldn't be eating milk, meat and milk together. This means, and this was also part of the underpinnings of, of many of the laws and teachings of the dietary laws. But it's, it's, it comes from a very different place. The, they understood God in a very, the ancient, the pagans' gods did all sorts of terrible things in, in, the, in, the, in the minds of people. Our God was, was seen, but was in a, in a modified manner. The, uh, today, we don't look at, I, I don't talk about God literally putting to death somebody who carries on Shabbat. I understand God differently because I see God through very various different lenses of philosophers and teachers. And, and, Let, me just, yeah. Let me just follow up with what Pastor Drew said that, but help us understand those passages as they go into the promised land. Go in there and kill every living, breathing man, woman, and child completely to the end. Yeah, I mean, the, the massacres that we're hearing, realizing that this is our Bible too. Yeah. Help us understand that kind of carnage and how we connect that with a grace-filled, loving God. Well... First of all, the, carne, uh, uh, the book of Joshua is not the most studied book in the, in, in the Jewish, uh, in Jewish congregations. One of the reasons is because people are uncomfortable with, with what, what took place in conquering. I had a teacher who, uh, gave, who, who gave a lecture on the book of Joshua, and he explained it in a very interesting way. He said, you know what you see here? <laughs> there was a divine command to, to take this land from, from its inhabitants. But what you don't see is you don't see any celebrations. 
There was never, in, in the book of Joshua, there are no celebrations of military victories. And I understand the book in its biblical, if you ask me to understand it historically and biblically, I say it reflects the time. It doesn't necessarily reflect, it reflects their understanding of God. But I say to us, we can still learn from it that, that yes, sometimes we have to fight wars, but we don't celebrate the fact that we, that we fight those wars. We don't celebrate the killing of, of other human beings because they're all from the same God. I'll give you one other teaching that, that illustrates this. And again, I'm going back to the time of the Pharisees, back to the time of the ancient rabbis, who were as uncomfortable with this as we are. There's, a, uh, there's also uh, in, in, the, in the Torah, at least on two occasions, they, they quote from the Code of Hammurabi. Uh, eye and tachad eye and shein tachad shein, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And so, the, it, by, the, by the time you were in the first century, the rabbi said, eye for an eye doesn't mean if you put out my eye, you, uh, I put out yours. It means that if you put out my eye, you're obligated to compensate me for the cost of that eye. The, the expenses it's going to cost me to repair but for health bills, the time away from work, so and so. They explained away what was literally, what was obviously taken literally in biblical times. They found a way to find, because life ultimately is, is, is what is uh, of most, most importance. Another midrash though that they told, another legend, and this was, if you recall it, the Red Sea. As soon as, as, soon as the, uh, the, uh, the Israelites got out of the, the Red Sea and the Egyptians come in and the waters come down, then suddenly the, uh, there's a legend, they say, that, that, the, that uh, the angels in heaven were, were singing and dancing and saying, your people are free, your people are free. And they looked to the throne of God and they saw tears coming. And the voice of God came to them and said, those people drowning in the sea, those are my people too. And so the, the, the notion that we have here, as we've, we've grown into understanding God as a compassionate God, as a caring God, um, but you can always find a verse, if you take it literally out of context, I was, a, I was a Navy chaplain when I started my career, and I'll never forget when I was in Navy chaplain school, and uh, there were a hundred of us in this class, uh, four rabbis and 96 uh, Christians. <laughs> Uh, and the, the, by the way, this is the chutzpah, the, this is the nerve of the, uh, that, uh, that, that Jews have, or that we've, convi we've convinced the world I, that it's divided into two, Jewish and Gentile. Yeah. While we make, you know, and even a, the, we have a mug, the, the Navy has a mug with, with, a sim with its, its uh, symbol on, and one side they have a cross, the other side a, 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 a Jewish star. Now, there were 14 active duty Navy chaplains when I was there, and there were 1,250 non-Jewish Christian chaplains, but yet we were still half the... Uh... <laughs> uh, I, I don't know, I, I, I'm not certain exactly where I was uh, going uh, with it. No, <laughs> I've got, I've got I don't know how much time, I've got another one that I know is gonna come up as we go through um, the Hebrew scriptures. Um, this concept of the Messiah, yeah. about what, um, what are the Jewish people looking for, anticipating, how will they know? Will the lion lie down with the lamb? Will the mountain in Isaiah 25 have a feast of fat things? And mm -hmm. how will we know? Well, it, it, it's a great question. question. And if, if, if you have the answer, yeah, I, I'd like to. I do, but, uh, but I'd like to. See the, <laughs> although I'm not, the, um, listen, if, if that could, you know, if any of us really had the answer, I think, and, and, and we could prove it to, to be the answer, I think everyone would join on, jump on board. I mean, I, I, rem, I recall, I'm gonna tell you one quick story and then I'll come back to that. Remind me what the question was again, though, because, because I'll forget the question, question amidst the answer. Uh, the, the late uh, Prime Minister of Israel, Menachem Begin, 
many years ago when he was prime minister, um, some of the, the evangelicals who, ha who, who are one of the, the, the strongest, who are among the strongest supporters of the state of Israel for whatever their reason may be, um, way would, would, we would be giving, we're donating tons of money to Israel and they'd come to Israel and they'd meet with the prime minister and they'd give him a check. And someone said to a prime minister Begin, how, how can you take money from these people? Don't you know that, that, we're, that we're part of their final agenda? And he said, well, you know what? We'll take the money now and see what happens later. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> let the Lord sort it out. <laughs> let, 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 and there's a joke there, too. Uh, the, uh, the Messianic era is, is a time that we work toward. And within, there's, a, there's a wonderful teaching that in, in our tradition that says if, uh, if someone comes, if you're planting a tree, I'll give you this in English, if you're planting a tree and someone comes rushing out to you and said, the Messiah is coming into town, the Messiah is coming into town, first finish planting the tree, then go greet the Messiah. The notion is that if there's going to be a messianic era, it's not going to be because because we, it's not going to be because we waited so, waited and waited and waited. It's because we worked hand in hand with each other to make that happen, and and that's uh, to that end. Prayer is for us a, a fire to light in our souls to get us out on the streets. I have a, had a teacher, uh, Professor Abraham Joshua Heschel, who who. Yeah, uh, who, who marched arm in arm with Martin Luther King in, uh, in, in Birmingham, Alabama. And he said after, after uh, marching with, uh, with Dr. King, he said, you know, I've always known how to pray with my mouth, but today I learned how to pray with my feet. And ultimately what he's teaching us is that, that we have to take the lessons that our traditions teach us and go out in the streets and make this a better world. Work on behalf of all peoples to bring peoples together. Then we'll bring about the messianic era. And in that time, then we can decide who, who's, who's right. <laughs> Thank you. Just like in, in Judaism, of course, there's so many different expressions of Christianity. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I would side with you that, that those expressions of Christianity that separate themselves from this world, whether it's the old monastic mm -hmm. uh, in which they're separating from this world, or even um, uh, the tradition that's talk about um, completely abandoning this world and just waiting for that time to leave this place mm -hmm. and be reunited yeah. in heaven. I think that misses the whole point about this Christian walk. For us, it is a both and. It is, it is living here in this world now, making this a better place. Mm -hmm. And for us, it is waiting for yet more to come. Well, I think, you know, and there's, we have, a, we have these ascetics within our tradition have had, I mean, one of the, the most famous places. Again, how many of you have been to Israel? Okay. Oh, you got... You, Really? You got to get yourselves over to Israel. If I'm here next year. 2021, we're going. Are we? Yes, 2021. Okay, I was going to say, if I'm here next year, I'm going to take a trip. I take, I, I, I take on my trips, I take, I take anybody. I take usually groups that are half Jew, half Christian. We, we go everywhere. By the way, and it's a, it's a good thing, when you go there, by the, it's common for, I've been taking tours many years for a long time, and always Jews will go to Jewish sites, and, and, the, and Christians will tend to go to Christian sites. But Jews never get up to see the sermon. Or up, like, well, I take them to, see, to uh, up the, uh, to the Hill of the Beatitudes, and uh, we'll go to uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and we'll go to uh, 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 the church where Jesus uh, um, uh, pr uh, was, the synagogue where Jesus was a member, uh, on the Galil, and a number of other places. And it's and we and we go to the Jewish sites. I think it's important to get the full full picture. You got to go to Israel. Yeah. The um, okay, what was the, that? But that that I think that was. I don't know if that was my comment, but that's <laughs> that, that's good enough. Do you have another one? Let's let's open it up here for a moment. Um, you can say your question, and then I'll repeat it for the the recording. Look how. Well, you did. There's no questions here. You know, you don't have to be. Oh, there we go. Ask me. Go ahead, any. Sharon. Yeah. I'm wondering whether you talk much about sin <laughs> and oh. your services and confessing. 
Man. Sin is an interesting word because it's a word that was developed by, by, by Christians. We, we, we don't have really a word in Hebrew that means sin, but we use the word sin. Um, we are, the word is, is, uh, is chata in Hebrew, which really means miss the mark. And what Yom Kippur was just about was this was a time when the community comes together to realize their transgressions of, of the past year. And on Yom Kippur, those transgressions between, the, between myself and God can be forgiven. But those transgressions, before I can come before God and ask for forgiveness to something I've offended a, a person, offended uh, any of you, first of all, I have to ask the person I offended for forgiveness. And only then can I come before God and ask for forgiveness. The uh, sin is, is not seen as a negative force. It's seen, at, quite frankly, as a positive force because it's through, it's through missing the mark that we come to understand where we need to go. When you're walking, a, you know, it's like taking a journey. Um, you know, sometimes you lose your way and you've got to find your way back. And so sometimes fa failure, sometimes transgression, it's sometimes sin, if you want to call it, is what wakes us up to what we need to be doing. So it's, it's not seen as, a, as, a, as, a, as an evil force. Although we say that there, there's, each human being has two, two uh, impulses operating within them. We, I mentioned God, what we call the Yetzir Tov and the Yetzir Ra, the good incl inclination and the evil inclination. And it's co constantly at battle with each other. But when you're going, when you do step off the track, you can always find your way back. And that's what Yom Kippur is, is about in a sense. Let me just follow up on what you said there. Um, I know that the um, Hebrew scripture does not have a whole lot of the devil or Satan. Really, the book of Job is where it really comes up. I think at one point, Satan is the tempter of David, one line yeah. there, but there's not much. No. How about in today, Judaism? Well, see, the word Satan, it's another word that's sometimes mistranslated. Satan was a, was a, or Satan, as they say, uh, was a stumbling block. In other words, we don't believe in a, in a devil of, of sorts because that's to suggest that there's more than one God in the world. There's a God of good and a God of evil. Um, but rather, they're stumbling blocks. The, the section in, in Job you're talking about, and that's interesting because that, the first chapter, have you read the book of Job? Okay. The first chapter is a, sort of a wager, right? That God's making with, uh, with the devil here, or with Satan. That was a late, a later addition to the book of Job. That was that it's a was totally different piece of literature genre. At the yeah. beginning, as opposed to the rest. That's right. It was it was added on. We don't know exactly where, but we there are several instances where where Satan or this evil or I don't want to say evil, but this obstacle it comes up. And in fact, the ancient rabbis made use of it in their in many of their legends. For instance, um, one example was. When Abraham, uh, when Abraham went up to, to, uh, to sacrifice his son Isaac, according to the tradition, you know what happened up there? Where well, they say that at that point uh, he didn't tell Sarah, right? Sarah had no idea what was going on, but uh, but Satan, trying to mix things up here, told Sarah what's going on, you know. And, and according to this to this legend, in fact, when she heard this, she just died on the spot. Yeah, um, it's. It's like a stumbling block, but not a force that would, that, to, to, that's an equal of God. In other words, when you watch some of the movies that you, uh, some of these, the, that, you know, make the, uh, I'm thinking now of the one, it, it stands out, Al Pacino. Um, I forget what the name of that, where, where he's, uh, that, yeah. that, you know. I remember. It, but what about that, that Lucifer is a fallen angel? Or what about the snake in the Garden of Eden? Is, is that just a stumbling block as well? Yeah, it's just a stumbling block. Yeah, the, the snake, the, 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 one way I see it, I see it was, it, was, it was not a mistake. It was meant to be. Humankind was meant to be tempted because they were never meant to stay in the Garden of Eden. They were given that they were they were they were shown the Garden of Eden. They were shown what the world can be like. Now you're going to go out and make it on your own. You're now you're going to go out and create 
what you have, have seen. Not unlike a, a wedding, by the way, when you, on, on, a, on, a, on a wedding day, everybody, the bride looks beautiful, the, the groom looks beautiful, everything is, is nice and perfect. Why? In a sense, and too many people see that as, as this is our, we're going to go riding off on, into the sunset. No. We're showing you what your life can be like if you really put things together. Now get out and start building that life. Now if you see it that way, your, your marriage is much more likely to succeed than if you see it, oh God, this is terrible. You know, it, 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 this is nothing like my marriage. It used to be up there. It yeah. used to be up And in a sense, I mean, this is my translation, my understanding of, of the, uh, this, the, there's other ways of looking at, at this as well. Hey, Carl. Is one of worth or greatness? Works. Work. Is it works based <laughs> or faith based? Thank you. Oh, Grace based or works it, it, based? By the way, it's a very good question. Being, you can be Jewish and not be part of Judaism. Judaism is the religious expression of being Jewish. To be Jewish, uh, one needs just to be born to a Jewish mother. And, and they, are, they are Jewish. How they express it is the, uh, religiously is through the act of, of uh, is the Judaism. And it's not a race, by the way, the, uh, because a race is blood pure. And, and Judaism was never blood pure. That was a mistake, by the way, that, uh, that the Germans made in World War II. They, they thought we're going to wipe out the Jewish race. But we're not a race because we have all sorts of people, black, white, yellow, green, what have you. And we accept and, and we uh, educate converts. So it's, and uh, there's a, a whole, if you go to Israel today, you're going to see a whole huge population of black Jews from Ethiopia who've now been there for one generation and have, have become acclimated to the, and, and uh, brought into the society. And so it's a, it's a, it, it looks very much, it doesn't look un, a lot unlike you know, the situ, you know, our, our populations. The, um, but the, there are Jews who, they're Jewish atheists, if you can believe it. Um, there's a, there, yeah, who's Edgar, oh, Bronfman? Uh, well, yeah. Uh, but, but he could afford to be an atheist. <laughs> He, 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 the Bronfman family were, were Seagrams, right? Yeah. The, uh, the, no, but there, there's, there are Jew, I, I won't say atheists. They're atheists. They're agnostics. There are, are Jews who see their, their Judaism through Zionism, through their, their, their belief in, and, and their, their, their commitment to the state of Israel. And there are Jews who find religion, who, who, who approach it religiously. And so there's... Um, but what about the question, Carl was asking, would you say it is that works-based, that is, now get out from the Garden of Eden and do it? Or yeah. is it grace-based that we can't do it, so it will be God's grace and forgiveness? And how, and where's the forgiveness? What's the forgiveness? Well, the forgiveness is that grace base that yeah. I can't, I have fallen short, I have yeah. missed the mark. Okay. Um, are you talking about with the Garden of Eden? Well, just not basically? just in life that yeah. I realize where the ideal is, love mm -hmm. your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. I know where the ideal is. I fall short of that glory. Mm -hmm. The, yeah, I, I mean, it's, I, I, I'm, I'm still, I'm, there, there, a diff, see, faith Faith is an interesting kind because I I think maybe we're taught I don't know if we're talking at the, about the the same at the same language in a sense in this the uh, what is it what does faith mean does is faith simply I believe in God I mean it uh, or is is or do we exhibit our faith in 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 other ways for instance the the person who says they don't believe in God yet they're out. Uh, finding homes for the homeless, feeding the hungry, and things of this sort. I mean, is, 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 is this faith? Yeah. And that's, um, uh, you know, I, that's where I, I, where there's a lot of people doing a lot of, there are people doing absolutely. good things, absolutely good yeah. things. And uh, I, I will leave you with this, uh, with this story. I won't leave you. I got, yeah, I will leave you. Here. <laughs> 
this, um, the, there, again, there, there's all these legends which, which the ancient rabbis developed to, these were rabbinical sermons, these were rabbi sermons probably, to explain and understand Torah. And they tell this one sermon where uh, God says to the angels, he says, so tell me, what are, what are the people doing down there on earth? And the angels say, oh, well, you know, God, they're, not, they're not going to, I'm, I'm, I'm updating it, they're not going to the synagogues, they're not, they're not going to churches, they're, they, they, don't, they, they won't talk about you. Well, what are they doing? Well, they're, they're feeding the, the, the hungry, they're, they're finding homes for the homeless, they're, you know, they're, they're doing good deeds, they're doing it, and God laughs. <laughs> better, better that they do what I'd like to them to do than to believe in me. Because ultimately, ultimately, they're doing my work. Well, if they if they say they're not if they say I don't believe in you, <laughs> good. But they're doing my work, and I think that that comes to express the fact that within Judaism, you know, we don't condemn by any means a person who says that they don't believe in God. But because I I ask them, well, what? How do you do? You believe in do you believe in doing good deeds? Do you believe in making this better? Yes, yes. And if they're actually doing it then you know what? They're doing God's work. And, I'm, and, and I say, who am I to judge? No. That leads you to hell. Hmm? That leads you, or leads you to wherever you're going. Wherever you're going. <laughs> I want to be, you need to cut out? Yeah. All right. I, I'll take one more question. All right, we got one more three, question three here. Three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Monica, is it a short question? Okay. Yeah. Why? What? And what? What do you mean by why the guy? The why well, I see. I I believe in the. That's a good question. I believe in the God of the Torah because, as I said earlier, I believe we have evolved, and we understand God differently than the ancients. I, I, I'll be honest, I don't believe that, the, that God wrote the five books of Moses, okay? I believe that, there, that, that people were, were divinely inspired and divinely inspired to put these words together. You know, I, I'm a, unfortunately, I'm a student. <laughs> I, I've studied, and I happen to know there's, a, I, I know there's Near Eastern uh, creation stories that are awful, awful similar to, the, to what, we, what, what ours is. It's that we've demythologized them. So I think that's the expression, and I have, you know, and God, I understand that God, I understand those stories, but I understand them in maybe a more metaphorical way. And I understand, and I accept them, but I understand God differently than the God of the Bible. But that was the, that's where I begin my journey. Okay. Let's thank uh, Rabbi Siegel for being here today. Thank you. So good to have you. And we we will get we will get together. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring you over, and we're gonna I, I'm gonna put together such questions. Oh, <laughs> bring it! I'm gonna walk him out, and uh, Drew will do a little debrief for the past next 15 okay. minutes. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.